Recorded live from the unfinished loft project of Des's home just outside Brighton in Sussex, welcome to the 200 to 100,000 pound challenge podcast. This is your no thrills, no BS, and absolutely no get rich quick or passive income promises hub. Hosted by your man, Des Hamilton. Right, Natalie, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, thanks for having me, Des. Uh, yeah, I've been really looking forward to uh, uh, coming on and, and getting to know everyone. Oh, I love it. I love it, honestly. Uh, so, yeah, I think a lot of people will know who you are. A lot of people have probably heard sessions from you. A lot of people were probably coached by you. But similar to what we had with Luke a couple of weeks ago, I don't know if many people actually know their journey, their beginnings. And as beginners, it's lovely to see people like you that have done so, so well almost go back to where you started what challenges you had and how you got to where you got to go to so with all that in mind talk us through your journey what got you started and what made you think you know what this is what i want to do um well i i we've got a little bit of a different story compared to most because uh i was actually a business person businesswoman entrepreneur whatever whatever label you want to call yourself i was that before um, I started selling on Amazon. So, you know, I've been responsible um, for fully feeding my kids and paying the mortgage for a really long time now, um, uh, probably about 15 years. And, you know, it's been kind of, and that's full time. Yeah. Uh, before that, it, it always been side hustles. You know, I think everyone's got that kind of story. We originally started on eBay when I was, uh, you know, about 16, something like that. And uh, buying and selling handbags, that's originally how I started. You know, in my earlier business career, it, it tended to kind of revolve around passions and things that I was interested in. And... Um, you know, we were really fortunate. Um, I was able to buy my first property at 18 um, because of the side hustles I'd been doing uh, alongside, you know, various different jobs. Never really settled in in an actual job. Uh, I was always, I would say I was always a really good employee because I kind of, I always got good results for other people, but I never had that burning desire to, to leave my job, really. It wasn't... So yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit unusual, whereas I think some people like hate working for the man. I always, whatever role I did, I always did, I was reasonably successful in it. So, you know, and I always worked for people um, that, you know, respected me and I respected them. So I, I, I like I said, I, I did a talk the other day um, at Seller Festival where I mm. got up and I felt I, I had to say at the start, I don't have that sob story, I'm afraid. Sorry, I, I don't, you know, I don't have the entrepreneurial sob story. So, um, but it, it, like yourself, Des, it probably got to a point where there is only so much time in a day uh, where you can do things. So um, I got the opportunity um, to set up a beauty salon, which is my first real world uh, kind of business on my own, essentially. Well, I had a business partner at the time. And um, so we went and did that for a few years, um, which was fun. <laughs> uh, I say fun because I don't know if you've ever managed a group of girls between the age of 16 and uh, probably 25, you know, it's not fun to be perfectly honest so uh we did that it gave me my first real business experience of you know filing accounts and you know setting up a limited company and doing this and doing that yeah. and at the same time my husband uh he had a restaurant so he had this you know great experience as well wow. with running his restaurant and over time um we we went into various different business models i sold my beauty salon uh he sold part of his restaurant um so i was saying the other day we we've it's only when you look back when someone asks you this question which i do rarely get asked because normally i'm in your seat you know yeah. asking the questions as opposed to answering them and you know we've been really successful over the years with setting up businesses and selling them we've done that three or four times now um and never really in the same field so we've been able to kind of adapt and evolve um but kind of fast forward maybe 10 years later i became a mum became a parent um becoming a mum didn't really affect things too much because you know when you've got a baby they just kind of come along with you when you've got just the one uh, to start with they just kind of our baby 
our first child kind of fit in around us around that time it's only when you've got to start taking them to school yeah and that's when the real commitment comes and you think right okay we need to maybe be mindful of what we're doing now and that's when the kind of reality set in and at that time during the time that i had my first child to the time he went to school we actually set up a distribution company and that distribution company focused on selling eco products wooden watches wooden sunglasses um bags made from plastic bags it had you know a kind of sustainable eco fashion edge to it and I we did it. that for, i love those yeah, sorts of watches it, by the way pardon I love that stuff, the wooden watches and stuff. I love that. But yeah, yeah well, it was, it was, you know, very emerging at the time. So we, we were in at the start of it, you know, emerging trends and, you know, sustainability, uh, throwaway fashion was very much in the, in the forefront of the media and, and everything like that. So it was the kind of hot kind of property at the time. Mm. So we did that and we were business to consumer so we sold the goods directly to customers ourselves and then we also uh, sold business uh, b2b business to business so wholesale for other businesses to sell our goods as well because we had the exclusive rights to these products in the uk and ireland and you know a few seven figure uh years later of of selling that we were doing incredibly well uh we were in some of the biggest shops uh, and retailers multi-chain retailers around the uk and everything was kind of going really swimmingly and then all of a sudden we just got hit by a massive unknown um which was or something that was outside of our control so the material uh in order for them to be classed as eco and sustainable the wood had to be sourced from a certain area mm. and all of a sudden there was this kind of worldwide shortage of this wood and we couldn't get hold of it anymore and so therefore production literally ceased and oh, no. for anyone yeah that's not been involved in the manufacture of product it's not a case of something that immediately impacts you you know because we had thousands of units that were available to us that had already been made mm. it was kind of six months later where the impact had occurred and i didn't know that at the time i thought i assumed okay a delay it's not going to have too much of an effect yeah and boy was i wrong because that had a massive impact on our business we went from award-winning distribution company uh you know multiple seven figures of these products being sold selling in some of the biggest retailers around the country to literally not being able to supply anyone going through a christmas period of lost uh consumer sales which um you know was which was huge for us and so all of our eggs were in this basket essentially so we went through that process and and it was heartbreaking because yeah. i can honestly tell you that if anyone thinks that building relationships which i consider myself to be reasonably good at um you know looking after customers providing excellent service when you cannot provide that when you are when people drop you like yeah. they drop you so quickly and that's exactly what happened so i'd spent two years for instance knocking on the doors um of the victorian albert museum in london we managed to get into uh their gift shop there which is one of the best gift shops in the country yeah. very exclusive um you know you imagine the units they sold about two months before our supply dried up and you know they took an order we became the fourth best selling uh, product in the shop overnight essentially wow. I think we were able to replenish the stock once and like I said I've been knocking on this door for two years um, and literally when I couldn't replenish the second time the stock because we had no stock it was like right see you later bye and then six months later when I tried to get back in there they were like no you let us down sorry oh. you know we can't we don't operate like that if you, yeah. you do not have that supply under your control we're not interested in working with people like yourself and it was like a massive slap in the face but also a wake-up call 
yeah. because yeah it was a massive wake up call because at the time you know we had a young family uh i don't think i was i i might have been i think i might have been expecting my second child by then and i was going around the country a lot so realization kicked in my son was starting school i think i was pregnant at the time we just lost we were like one month away from not being able to pay a mortgage oh. and it was like what do we do now so we kind of set ourselves a task and i said to my husband matt we can't rely on this anymore so we both went out and found ideas of of what we could do and matt came with his idea and i came with mine i came up with a bouncy castle company <laughs> at the time and I was because I was really into you know because obviously having a young child I was going to lots of parties yeah, I was of seeing course. it happen and I really liked the idea of creating a children's entertainment company Got starting it. with bouncy castles going into hiring you know like the Elsas or and uh, Rapunzel's to come in and do shows for the kids and you know it wasn't just bouncy castles but bouncy castles were the start and my husband was like are you kidding me you expect me because he said you're not going to go in and roll out the bouncy castles i like no i'll get the business you, you know you you can do that side of it and he literally laughed in my face and then he sort of came up with the idea of amazon arbitrage uh he'd seen it in america and while he laughed in my face uh about the bouncy castles i think i laughed even harder in his face when he came up with this idea of Amazon arbitrage, because he said, um, you know, he explained the, the process. We went to Sainsbury's. He, he sort of said, look, we buy something like this, a coffee machine. You know, this was, this was seven years ago. Right. Um, buy a coffee machine and we buy it for this price and we sell it on Amazon for this price. I was like, what? Don't be ridiculous. <laughs> No one's going to pay that. You know, when we come from eBay originally, that's where we'd started. And, you know, I, I, I think at the time I was aware that Amazon had third party sellers, mm. but it was like they were selling potato peelers and garlic presses, you know, what you see in traditional private label products, you know, not other people's branded products. This would have been so really come... early days of Prime as well, I guess. I should imagine Prime was, it was Prime. Yeah, it'd been thing? around. It had been around, I think, at that point for about two or three years. Oh, okay. So, but it was still, I mean, we had Prime as a customer by that time. Um, but yeah, it, it, in its infancy, I suppose, a little mm. bit now. But I think we've been selling for, for seven years and we probably first discovered this because it took us about a year before that. So it's probably about eight years ago. So maybe a couple of years out from, from Prime originally or FBA and um it took us a while to find what we wanted to do because we didn't actually start in arbitrage we actually inadvertently started in wholesale because at the time uh these lazy spas were just coming out you know the blow up hot tubs yeah. and um matt my husband's very resourceful you know he's a he's a fantastic saucer and he was able to identify a source for the filters for these hot tubs and he said, look, I'm going to give it a go. And we weren't even doing FBA. This was, you know, I think we didn't even have a professional seller account. It was fulfilled by merchant. And he said, I'm going to sell these and uh, these these hot tub filters because they seem in really short supply. And I said, OK, good luck with that kind of thing. I said, I'm going to put some on eBay and let's see who wins. And um, so he put them on Amazon. I put them on eBay and I'm pretty sure you'll be able to guess who won. Not only did they outstrip the sales on eBay, because uh, like I said, they were hard hard to come by at the time anyway. So the, the, the demand was good on eBay anyway. Yeah. But I think the sales was like six to eight times higher wow. um, at a higher price than it was on Amazon. So I had to get my kind of ego in check a little bit. My ma and you know sort of say okay maybe maybe there's something in there send the bouncy maybe. castles back i'm not interested exactly put the pump away i think we need to you know step away from the bouncy castles i do love bringing that story up though every time we go to a kids party uh i do say look this could have been you <laughs> he's not he's never impressed He's never We've got this impressed. vision of you walking outside of the v a and then there's a bouncy castle in the square somewhere and going <laughs> 
exactly have a look at that that could have been you <laughs> and the rest is history you know essentially because it's you know we discovered amazon and whilst today it still doesn't remain our only you know income source it is very dominant in our income sources uh through selling so we spent the next you know few years selling um you know in the various it, arbitrage is where we kind of ended up we explored private label i do my own version of private label which of course is unique bundles mm. uh which if anyone does know me that's probably where they associate or know me from yeah. is um you know teaching that method here in the uk and um yeah coaching um software uh, Facebook groups, you know, all of those things that that kind of go with the trappings of of being a an Amazon guru, essentially, which is uh, a <laughs> long guru now. <laughs> this is it. I did a whole thing a little while ago saying how no one identifies themselves as a guru except you, Nat. You you're the yeah. only one. Damn yeah, right. I am a guru. You know, I think it's one of those things. I think if you saw any type of information, obviously it's the quality of the information. Uh, I think that, it, you know, differentiates um, whether someone is a certain type of guru versus uh, a different, you know, a, a different type of one. But I often joke about my Lambo parked outside and, <laughs> you know, and, and things like that. So, but no, I don't, I do not have a Lambo parked outside. I would be amazed know. if you had a Lambo parked outside. That would be amazing. No, I do yeah. not have, I, I'm not even sure I could get in one, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> so I, I'm guessing then, and stop me if I'm wrong here, but Having had such a successful business in something that was so different and then the world comes crashing down without any influence from you, it was completely out of your control that your world just comes crashing down. When you knew you were going to start something new, was diversification of income streams, was that in the forefront of your mind? Not at that moment. I would say it's only really been the last three to four years where we've really worked hard to protect ourselves um, in terms of multiple income streams. I think when it first happened and we discovered Amazon, and Amazon was a very different platform, you know, sort of seven, eight years ago than it, mm. than it is today. Um, and when we first discovered Amazon, I think it was just a relief more than anything else. You know, it was like, <gasps> few because we did carry on with the distribution business because the supply did return after that okay. um so it didn't it didn't stop dead we carried on with both uh for a period of time and the distribution business ultimately ended uh due to uh saturation of the market to be perfectly honest so yeah. we were a middleman we had we did not manufacture ourselves we we had the distribution rights and all of a sudden uh wooden watches and and that kind of thing became incredibly popular and um there was no room profit wise for us and we've always existed in quite in everything we do we try and exist in high margin um uh, businesses um you know because there's there's a lot of protection um in that in in particular when you're dealing with um physical products because there are so many costs involved in terms of outsourced staff and you know just little things like refunds mm. i think a lot of people don't realize when you sell a physical product for every 10 products you sell there's a good chance that you're going to get 0 0.5 or one of those back yeah. and that could wipe out the next three or four sales exactly. so working in margins higher margins has always been something that we've done that's one of the things of 15 to 20 years because my husband's been in business you know or self-sufficient in business for probably about five years longer than I have I, I stayed in the employed game a little bit longer than he did um, and you know for that it, it, you look at things slightly differently i was talking about this at the seller festival the other day when i look at something i'm very fortunate to be in a position where i look at it through eyes that are 15 years business old essentially so i i look at something very differently to how someone might be starting out maybe like me. been doing it yeah. for three months yeah absolutely you know right. or, yeah and it's a different kind of perspective it might have happened to me before already or it something similar might have happened or I'm not reliant on that sale or mm. you know something like that so it's it, it's very subjective 
in terms of experience. Uh, I don't care how much someone sold, to be perfectly honest. You know, in this business, you can go from zero to seven figures in a year. Mm. I have personally mentored people that have done that. Amazing. So I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't. I don't really care for how much someone has sold essentially for me it's it's that level of experience um yeah. that you that I feel very fortunate to have been able to have gained over the last you know 15 years x amount of years yeah. so going back sorry your original question it wasn't a case of uh, we were just grateful at the time whereas our business acumen I suppose grew over the last five years in particular where and that that happened to us again by the way after that as well so I wouldn't say we learnt from that first time either we got into a position where we were reliant on on one thing and that kind of crashed and burned a little bit and um, I yes yeah, so you don't necessarily make one mistake and you learn from it and your life changes forever you know I still make whoppers of mistakes now to be perfectly honest but as long as you always learn from it eventually I think so I would say it's yeah the last three or four years that's really when we've worked hard to protect ourselves in business as much as we can through yeah. diversification yeah no it's a it's a it's a really good response and if I was to sort of if I'm listening to this from the outside, the thing that shines through from both you and your husband is this work ethic that you had at such a young age. And I think this is really yeah. important because when you talk about my journey and my generation, we were taught that the work ethic always shines through, you know. This whole side hustles for the broken lazy, this that's what drives me mad. Because I don't care if you're 20 or you're 40, it's this ethic that you need Otherwise, it's just not going to work. And you can see the 20-year-olds that are out there doing it at the moment. They've all got it. They all understand the, yeah. the effort, the totally. graft. And the fact that Matt running a restaurant, I know how hard it is to run a restaurant. That is savage. I can imagine the hours he must have been putting in for that. And then you with the beauty salon, like you say, with the teenage girls. For, to go to that and then come together and say, right, let's work together for a business. I should imagine with that much effort... And that much of a mindset where you know you're going to be growing with your challenges, you know, I think you 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 were always destined to do well with that. That's how it sounds. Yeah, I think it's it's one of those things that we're fortunately now in a position where, and like I said, it's only really been the last three or four years. I can i mean matt's completely unemployable you know he'll be on the streets before he'll go back into a job <laughs> and that's not because he's not got you know he's one of the hardest working people i know he just cannot be told what to do you know by anyone he i like i said we, we often joke about it i'm like matt you wouldn't last five minutes in an office nowadays you know for for various different reasons because the world has changed so much mm. since we were both unemployed i think i'd be able to adapt but even i would struggle you know i'd probably just wander off in the middle of the day and go and do something they'd be like uh natalie where are you going oh sorry can i can i not do that <laughs> so uh, yeah. can i not come in today or, or or whatever you know you get into these kind of habits but yeah, we were quite unusual at the time because I met my husband when I was 16 and he was 19 and we both had this burning desire um, to, I don't, his was always to be, I had a burning desire of success. I didn't know where that success was going to come from. I didn't know if it was going to be through my own endeavors or I didn't know if it was going to be rising through the ranks of a company. Like I said, I certainly hadn't worked that out. I'd always... I'm kind of a bit of a Jill of all trades. I can turn my hand to most things. Um, whereas Matt was very much a case of he wanted to run his own business. Simple as that. Um, and, he, you know, and he had to work his backside off, off for it as well. So whereas you're absolutely right. But we were unusual. But interestingly, we both, I come from a very traditional family, you know, 2.4 kids, pay your mortgage pay your dues you know it, i i don't know where it came from in me uh matt's got a slightly more entrepreneurial family i would say so in matt's family um 
most of you know cousins siblings you know that type of thing run their own business but mm. you know no one's like a billionaire no one's elon musk or anything like that so it was more a case of his dad was a builder you know that type yeah. of thing yeah, you yeah. know that the, yeah that type of thing so it's um yeah i but now it is crazy the ethics of the the younger kids now due to the influence of social media i mean it's one of those i love it and i loathe it at the same time for that generation because i think look there's only going to be 20 percent of the 20 percent of the 20 percent of the one percent that are really going to make it yeah. and for the rest of them it's going to be a real hard kind of cold fish in the face slap fish in the face you know yeah. um so yeah it, but they are prepared to work for it i i see a lot of really successful young young entrepreneurs in this space in particular uh, that have done phenomenally well and good for them yeah no i completely agree i completely agree right so if we take your journey then so you're selling these hot tubs 10 to the dozen um at what sort of <laughs> no, the point filters, the filters. So, <laughs> beg your pardon the filters beg your pardon so at what point did you and matt have the conversation to say all right this is the one let's see what we can do with it um again we were very much the hot kind of trend at the time was more retail arbitrage um so we were 80 percent retail arbitrage i developed an an interest in going out shopping funnily enough quite early on and you know picking up stuff it was the day i mean what was interesting we spent the first probably two and a half three years on amazon uh pretty much just in toys that's what it was at the time that was the trend yeah. i don't think we even got ungated in beauty for about two or three years uh and health and personal care because you had to ungate in for everything all of the main categories at that time it's whilst this business isn't easier we always talk about there was a lot more hurdles to start mm -hmm. a few years ago whereas it's easier to start now but overall the business is harder if that makes sense yeah. um so we were going round and it was quite early on that I because I still hadn't really seen the power of Amazon to be perfectly honest you know these hot tubs but there was still very much I was still very much aware like I said I'd, I'd been in business for such a long time at this point anyway I'm very aware of the rules of supply and demand you know at the time these hot tub things they were very, in very short supply and it was in the middle of a boiling hot summer so demand was through the roof mm -hmm. so i was yeah i was totally aware of that so um i d still didn't quite believe it and i remember we went down down to toys r us and um at the time they say sell what you know our son like i said around five years he was obsessed with thomas tank engine and Toys R Us used to do three for two on all of the take and play and the Trackmaster uh, and everything I miss like. Toys R Us. Yeah, I yeah. know yeah, it's just great. And Incredible. yeah, and we went in there and we looked at it, and all you had was the you know the Amazon seller app. There wasn't any SaaS. There wasn't any Buybot Pro. There was there was nothing. It was the Amazon seller app that didn't even add up correctly because it didn't have that on fees. Uh, you know, it didn't have all of the correct fees in it. You kind of didn't have Keeper, or you know, you had to you had a BSR. That was it. Yeah. And um, wow. we look, yeah. So it was a lot of gut instinct, a lot of gut instinct, especially if you were doing RA. Mm. So we picked up these Thomas Take and Play sets. It was the Misty Island Adventure. I always remember it was the Misty Island Adventure, and we bought six of them, three for two. So obviously paid for four. Uh, sent them in. Uh, I think it was about twenty quid profit in each one, which <laughs> nowadays everyone twenty quid profit. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> that's amazing. They call you a liar. Um, they would call you a liar. I know, I know. They absolutely would, and I would understand that. And so we sent them in. And again, this was before fulfillment center transfer issues. And believe it or not, guys, uh, there used to be a time where you used to send stuff in. And it all used to arrive at the same time and go into stock at the same time. Uh, so a very different world uh, than it is now. And they went in and they went into stock. Six went into stock at once. And I think I checked and maybe there was a sale. And I said to Matt, wow, there's a sale. And he was maybe out or something like that. And by the time he got back of where he was, all six were sold. Oh. Like, and it was in like two hours, maybe hour and a half, two hours. All six were sold. 
you know, 20 quid profit on six, you know, 120 quid. And I was like, oh, sorry, I don't know if I can say that. Luke's last week right. was a nightmare, you can imagine. But yeah, we got through that. I, I, well, I'll tell you what, Luke, if you are watching this, Luke knows exactly what I'm going to say. He sends me voice notes and I have to make sure my daughter's out of the room. <laughs> because Same. she's, yeah, she literally sends him uh videos back saying you naughty man why are you swearing so much she hates swearing so i always send them to him and hoping that he's gonna change his ways but obviously he doesn't um <laughs> sorry so, no i digress yeah so these all sold six <laughs> six in the six in the six couple of sold 120 quid profit i mean obviously i'm i'm talking in general terms uh you know 100 quid 120 quid profit and it was like okay imagine if we 10x this Imagine that, you know, grand, because one of the, one of the key things in life we've always done, um, later on in business, I, I don't think this was at the time we didn't have this philosophy, we kind of adopted this throughout the years as, as we, as we go through, whenever we think about starting a new income stream, um, we do not even consider starting it if we do not think it has the possibility of earning a minimum of uh, a thousand pounds uh, a month right and I know it doesn't sound a lot um, a... it doesn't sound a lot um, but we we wouldn't consider that and then at that point I'm thinking okay um, so a thousand pounds a month uh, and with the potential to get to around ten thousand a month you know that that's how we determine an income stream and at that I'm thinking well this has got like a grand potential profit in it a day. You know, let, let, if I 10x this up, 120 quid profit a day. Mm. If I 10x this, then, um, you know, this this could be it. We might not need to find anything else kind of thing. So we, we had that realization really early on. And I think we started selling in June. So we went through the Q4. We did phenomenally well during Q4. We were out buying toys and it was fun. My kids loved it. Yeah. Uh, I think, I'm not sure if I had the baby by then, but I, you know, my son loved it. We had the classic, you know, if, yes, if there's a spare one, you can have it, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, we just loved it. We were living our best life. And, and the distribution company, it was going down at that point in terms of less, less orders were coming in. But I also found myself, I never know to this day whether or not it could have continued, but I found myself falling in love with Amazon yeah. and not falling in love with uh, having to sit on a train, going up to London to go and meet the people of House and Fraser and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. I fell in love with Amazon more, so I, I'll never know to this day whether or not it, it could have been saved a little bit more. Or so, but ultimately, and again, I spoke about this in in my talk the other day at Seller Festival. It gave us options, which I think I will always try and strive to be in that position of whatever we do in life that we have the choice and are not forced. Because when you look at those two different scenarios, they completely will always have a very different outcome as to whether you're making that choice or whether it is forced upon you. So, um, and that was the choice at the time. We, we moved into Amazon and the rest is history, essentially. That really resonates, the choice versus forced. I think that's, that's great. Because we were talking earlier about when you were sort of uh, working, when you, you never had to work for the man type thing. And I'm in a situation where I probably do consider myself working for the man. But I like my job, you know, and I like the people. Yeah. And this whole quitting, it's nothing to do with the antipathy that I have to my job. It's more about, I'm not sure if that's the right word, but anyway, it's its more about exactly that. I, I had to go up to London this week. I missed Seller Festival because I had to go up to London this week. Yes, I remember. I was going to see you there. Yeah. That's it. And that wasn't my choice. It was exactly that. And you talk about when we are kids at a certain age. Of course, that's when structure kicks in because they need timings and things like that. And it's all of a sudden it's not so much what do I do with my day it's now what do I do with the few hours that I've got and when you're forced into running those few hours in a way that isn't your choice you do end up resenting it and I think that's a really really valuable thing I've written that down because I'm going to go and talk to my wife about it the choice thing is yeah that's massive 
It does, and it, it, it makes such a huge difference. Like I said, everything in my life now is done through choice. I'm not forced to do anything, or I don't allow myself to be forced to do ev uh, to do anything and, and, and everything I do. So it's half term next week, something as a dad of four. Uh, you've got four, haven't you? Four, yeah. Yeah, four. Uh, <laughs> something that I now... Yeah, it's half term next week. I'm going to spend the week with my kids. Yeah. I'm not going to feel guilty about it. I'm not going to uh, make any excuses about it. I'm not going to say to such and such, a, you know, I don't have to answer to anyone. I'm just going to spend the week with my kids. You know, my son's nearly 13. Whether he'll want to spend the week with me is a, you know, is a different thing. So he doesn't have that choice yet, unfortunately. So I can force it on him. Okay. Uh, I can force my, <laughs> can force my presence. Um, but yeah, I'm. We're going to go out. We'll, we're we're going to do some stuff. Uh, booked him for like pumpkin making sessions and and whatnot. And people often say to me, I don't know how you have the time. You know, we do run several businesses. I do have young youngish children. My son's thirteen. Uh, he's becoming less reliant on me now, yeah. but my daughter's only seven. So from that point of view, I do get that question a lot. How do you juggle everything? To be perfectly honest, and I don't want this to sound blasé, but because I have that, that choice now, that option of choice, it's relatively easy because of the way that I've set it up over the years. Um, and the way that I structure my time and my day and I separate when I'm working to when I spend time with my children. My family time is my family time and no one can infiltrate that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if that time is dedicated to my family and my children, then um, I've managed to put myself in a position through the way that I organize my time, my time management and the way that I run this business that I am able to, and I'm very good at saying no to people now, whereas I didn't used to be. That's These are all the little things you learn uh, throughout business um, in years. It's not about how I can walk into Tesco's and know whether something's going to sell or not. You know, yes, you, you, you get that. And I love the phrase that Alan Sugar talks about when you get to smell what sells. Mm. That absolutely becomes very much part of you know this entrepreneurial business uh, journey but at the same time like i said for me the value comes in my experience of of being able to say no to people uh yes or uh, I, you can do this and you can do that and um but that's the important part but also being adaptive with it as well because um i was 40 two years ago and I set my goals every year and I do a, a selection of short term, medium term, long term goals. And the last time I set my goals before that was in my 30s and my children were babies at that point. So when I turned 40 and the, I think it was the year after that, my children were needing me a little bit less, obviously not my daughter, but my son in particular. And it was a real realization of, OK, I'm going to have to change this now because the goals that I thought that I had five years ago are going to be very different because in five years time, my son's going to be 18. How much is he going to need me when he's 18? Mm. I mean, I cry myself to sleep at night at the thought of it, <laughs> unfortunately, that he's not going to need me that much. My children are going to be older. My daughter will be a teenager by that point. And it would just be me and Matt, you know, kind of left on our own. And, um, I sort of said, I need to revise my goals because the goals that I'd set five years before were based around my children being babies. And they're not gonna be babies anymore for in the next five years. So I had to shift and adapt and change those goals around that, which actually involved me making quite a big change in my life and um, you know, partnering with Matt Wright and Johnny to form the Hive and Be Stocked, mm. um, you know, because Throughout the last 10 years of being a mum, which is always first and foremost for me, you know, there is nothing that comes above that. If, mm. you know, we had this appointment today to, to film this podcast, but if one of my kids needed me, you know, unfortunately, you're a, you're a parent, you're a dad, you oh, understand Absolutely anyway. right, yes. 
But of course, if one of my children needed me, that's it. It would have been, I'm very sorry, but I, you know, I, I'm going to have to rearrange. I can't do it. You know, kids come first. We mm. go to every play. We go to every sports day. Didn't have kids to put them in childcare. Yeah. And I don't want anyone to think that, oh, well, it's all very well you saying that. And, you know, but I have to do that. And I understand that entirely. And I'm not going to have that Kim Kardashian moment you know, from a very privileged uh, position where she turned around and sort of said, oh, just get off your ass and work. <laughs> well, it, you know, that's just ridiculous. It's all about, you know, it's very easy to look and 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 do something from, from that kind of position. Of course it is, you know, we're all not in the fortunate, uh, in the, you know, position as that. But I, it became a priority so for those 10 years where my my children were babies i the priority was on them which it will always be um but i was not as probably successful or motivated as much during that time as i am now yeah if that makes sense no it makes because perfect the focus sense. has shift, shifted yeah i mean from my point of view, being someone on the other side of the fence, that is a goal for me to aspire to. It was it was one of the driving motivations for me to do mm. that. And my kids, especially my eldest, I mean, she's 10. So she's now getting a bit of awareness of the work ethic involved to make nice things happen. She's kind of figuring out that connection, you know. And the fact that Definitely. she can see me doing this. And yes, we talk about Disney holidays and we talk about nice cars and we talk about, you know... But it's more a case of, I can do every school run. I can come to all the sports days. Exactly that. This morning, before we spoke, we went and checked out the primary school for our three-year-old who starts next term. Just that stuff that I wasn't able to do. And the eye-opener for it, from my point of view, was that I had two children pre-COVID. And I had two weeks paternity and a week's holiday, and then I'd go back to work. And then I'd barely see him because I came home I have a yeah. half hour before bed. Then COVID happened, I went off on paternity, our third child was born, and I didn't go back to work, because COVID happened. And it was all of a sudden, hang on a minute, it's actually nice seeing my kids every day for the first year yeah. of their life, you know. And now I've got our youngest here, it's just such a motivating factor. So I, I, you're right, it's not, a, it's not a Kim Kardashian thing, it's not. But it is something that you've worked to achieve, that people like me can aspire to, to have, you know. It's, it's a lovely thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's something, and like I said, you're going to have different goals and different milestones and and different successes. And so many people do get into this business thinking, wow, I'm going to get myself a Porsche and I'm going to spend three weeks in Disney every year and I'm going to have a five bed exact house and things like that. But when what happened during the pandemic was people got a taste of what, you know, we'd been building 10 years of our life uh the last 10 years before the pandemic to have because we already had it at that point mm. which was yeah. during that 10 years we didn't worry about the financial side of things uh too much because we'd been doing it long enough that we knew that we'd always be able to make money but what scared us during that time is the thought of if it went wrong then one of us would have to go and get a job yeah. and one of us would not be able to see the pick the kids up one of us would not be able to see the school plays and your children and i can say this to another parent are yours and you have their attention for such a short period of time i read a statistic by the time they turn 12 you would have spent 80 percent of the time that you're going to spend with them throughout their lives wow. And yeah, it's it's just a mind blowing statistic. And so for me, that first 10 years in particular was really about me running a business to be a full time mum, mm. you know, um, whereas when I say full time mum, I wasn't in a position to be a full time mum, as in. A, a, a partner working and, and, and something like that. Yeah. But it kept, you know, there were there was there were struggles in that time when i say full-time mum, i didn't get a maternity pay no. i didn't get uh you know my kids are sick i i don't i don't get i don't get paid 
to take care of them or you know sick pay or or, or something like that when i had my daughter um i was answering emails in the hospital bed at night and you know the the midwives were like you kind of need to rest and i'm like she's asleep i'm yeah, all right i've had a cesarean <laughs> i'm good <laughs> I'm, I'm not going anywhere and you know so um it was it, that's what that 10 years was about um and this is what i'm saying is that realization a little bit now whilst we're still very much in mum and dad mode and parent mode and that will always be first but the dynamic has changed ever so slightly and with that we've changed with what our goals are long-term goals in yeah. particular it's funny and it's the thing that i'm finding myself sharing a lot it's a <laughs> peek behind the curtain here when i do the school run and come back in the car on my own I kind of put my phone on phone recorder mode and just ramble at it and then that forms my content for the next month or so. But at the moment I'm finding myself becoming really increasingly aware of that transition, of having that safety net of sick pay, annual leave. I could just decide I'm gonna take my foot off the gas for a month and I'll still get the same money. That transition into an unstructured, unfiltered world without a ceiling, it's it's scary. But um it's yeah. it's so scary and one of the great sellers um in our world um is a guy called mark penn i don't know if you've ever seen any of his stuff yes and he's a very motivating seller uh to be able to listen to and um one of his biggest bits of advice i mean i was never in this position because like i said i was um already running my own business by the time i found amazon but you know he's like keep your job as long as you can keep that security as long as you can um and don't be ashamed to admit that you want to keep it uh for as long as you can it doesn't mean that you're scared of success it doesn't mean this it doesn't mean that it's just the sensible thing to do because i think when people make that transition from paid employment there are so many benefits that you lose at the start it's like a tipping scale mm. um you are very much in a self-employed deficit uh to start with because of what you what you choose to leave behind the security of paid employment a regular wage everything that goes with that mm. but then also at the same time yes you're exchanging that for uh time which is the most valuable thing that there is mm. but at the same time you have to make sure that you set it up right so that time when it does come to transition that you're not spending your time panicking and worrying about it uh, because otherwise what will happen is you'll very quickly slide into a position of you might go back uh, regress uh, essentially because yeah. you're worrying uh, you uh, what happens is that you get anxiety yeah. uh, and then you can get overwhelmed and then procrastination and you end up become becoming a busy fool yeah uh you know sort of essentially i, I don't mean you in particular but you know <laughs> that I've, I've i've seen it i've seen it happen quite a few times when people have left their job because like i said there's everything else because you still need to do everything else you still need to be a parent mm. you still need to do this and if anything you'll often hear people saying oh i haven't got time to work now you know because you end up doing so much more yeah Choosing to leave a paid position is one of the bravest things I think anyone will do um, because it's not easy. Uh, it's it's not uh, guaranteed. It comes with a hell of a lot of stresses. Yeah. It's so many people's dreams to be able to do it. But at the same time, it's it's not for everyone, to be perfectly honest. it's it's it, I've seen many people regress back very successful people regress back because they've underestimated that transition. I can believe it. I think our respective audiences are of a similar generation. And yeah. when you... We, we've had this conversation. We <laughs> have, haven't we? But when you are our generation and when you've been in employment for God knows how long, your pension matters. Uh, just Absolutely. those sorts of things, you know, and you think, hang on a minute, I've got to protect myself. Anyway, we could ramble about this for ages now. We've got about 20 minutes left, I reckon, and we've not even touched a hive. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's good. This is really You know good me, stuff. queen of rambles. <laughs> You're in good Walking company, queen. I promise you. You're all good. So um, let's talk about your mentoring and your, well, let's talk about your training hub as well. You mentioned Matt and Johnny. 
Talk us how you went down that path. Well, I've been really, like I said, one of the things I absolutely love to do, um, and I had to, had to do it because I am quite a people person. I enjoy the company of people. I like to talk, you know, and I like to converse with people. So for me, it was, you know, being that bedroom bandit person sat in a sat in a room um, where I was just I just couldn't do it. So this is when I sort of found the uh, Amazon communities and I started talking to people in the Amazon communities and um, I struck up a, a friendship and a relationship with a, a, another guy called Matt, Matt Webley from the Secret Wealth Project. And he was my first sort of mentor in this kind of space. And he, um, you know, gave me my first, you know, confidence in being able to talk to people and, and do this kind of thing, which I absolutely didn't have. I've always been a confident person, but doing it and talking in front of people and, and all those kind of things, you know, that it, it doesn't naturally it's a certain go together. Skill set, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it's a skill set I've had to develop over the years and um so you know we developed that and i went into coaching and mentoring and at the time it was very much a case of <coughs> excuse me i started working with people one-to-one -one and i created a course uh, i started working with people one-to-one -one first of all and i created a course um with matt and it was a course that you know because the world was becoming a little bit disenchanted with arbitrage you know price tankers were rife all of the frustrations like i said i assure everyone all of these frustrations were here years ago anyway yeah. and i'd actually discovered one thing i'm quite good at is foresight and looking at is this going to last and i could very much see the arbitrage model albeit and uh, I still do it now, by the way. I just want to make it clear. So when I say this, I don't want to upset. But it's a very low-hanging fruit model mm. in the sense that it's quite easy to set up, easy to do, two different things. Um, but it's quite easy to set up. And when something is so accessible in terms of, um, you know, the information, um, people like Matt bought out softwares um, at the time, Bible Pro, they, you know, people like that that were so influential in the space made it so accessible to even a wider audience. So I could see it becoming saturated. And um, I looked at the model and I said, okay, so I really love Amazon. Why would I want to sell anywhere else? And I looked at the private label. She kind of floats my boat. I'm a, a semi-creative person. I thought I'd be quite good at it. But I looked at it and I was like, right, I need X amount of money to launch this and do this and blah, blah, blah. And so, okay, I did the math and I was like, right, 10 grand. I, I worked it out. And this was, you know, this was six, six years ago, maybe. I was like, right, I need 10 grand. It'd be even more now. Um, and I'm going to launch it. And by the time I get into my third order, I still don't know if it's going to work or not. Because you have to sell it at a loss. You have to do this. You have to do that. For someone who likes mitigating risk, I, I like a sure thing. Mm. Um, because of the work that I'll do up front on that. I thought, no, this isn't going to work for me. So I found uh, the bundling model in the US. But no one was doing it here. Like, no one was doing it here. And I thought, okay, this is interesting. So I tried it out. Did it over a Q4, and some of the products that we created just smashed it up like 150 units a day. <laughs> and at the time, the monetary profit for um, RA had gone from, you know, this th when we first started out RA OA arbitrage, it was very much a case of 50% ROI or five pound monetary profit, or you didn't touch it, you know. Can you imagine that time? That's what it was. <laughs> and that was slipping down. Whereas when we got unique bundles, we were getting these things selling 150 a day. And it was like eight pound profit, Ooh. 10 pound profit. And we're like, okay, again, the cog started working. Something's here. And so we went and did that. And we carried on with that. And we built that market in the UK. 
And then a few people kind of found out that I was doing this model, doing something a little bit different. So I created a course. And at the time, the course, you know, it didn't go out to a huge amount of people uh, because I think people were still very wary of this kind of thing. It was like, what the hell are you talking about? And But the people that it did and who followed the instructions, then they became kind of successful. And then it got to the point where I sold the course a couple of times over and like a couple of launches kind of thing. And I sort of said, you know what? The trouble is with this stuff, it moved so quickly. By the time I'd finished the course recording it, by the time the first intake had kind of finished, half of it had changed. Yeah. You know, Amazon had moved the goalposts or they'd done this and they'd done that. And so to cut a very long story short, um, we eventually decided to go into a position that we would uh, stop doing static courses and I would move into um, mentorship in a group setting, you know, masterclass, uh, whatever you want to call it. I, I still don't know what we call it now. I, I, on the website, I still don't know what we call it. Yeah, it's almost like subscription-based learning, isn't it? It's, like, it's, a, it's a different yeah. model, but it's taking off and I think you, you were one of the first ones I know that actually implemented it. Yeah, we did it. We did it originally uh, with my former business partner, and um, and then we and as time sort of progressed and and everything like that, uh, I met Matt and Johnny, um, who bought something different because the thing is, I do what I do, and um, you know, if you're going to appeal to a wider set of audience, you need different skills mm. uh, involved. And Johnny is one of the most talented uh, sellers I've ever met in terms of, you know, he's a top 250 UK wholesale seller. Um, so what he built a multi million pound business, um, you know, in a very short period of time uh, using the software that we've now eventually developed for commercial purposes. Uh, which is still in testing. You know, <laughs> don't build software, guys. And certainly don't give a launch date because you'll never hit it. Um, so top tip there. <laughs> We're still about six months behind. Um, so with that, and then, you know, Matt Wright as well, uh, great European eBay seller, uh, Amazon seller, Shopify seller, you know, incredibly smart, focuses on, you know, uh, different areas of the business, liquid uh, liquidations, clearances. So we kind of thought, okay, this is developed, you know, it's a good relationship mm -hmm. and um, kind of came up with the name The Hive because it, we sort of like had this hive mind that was being pulled together for all these different various kind of routes. Mm -hmm. So um, I came up with that purely because... I felt a bit disingenuous charging someone. By the way, I'm, I'm like, always super cheap. I'm like the cheapest person going uh, in terms of what I charge for stuff. And um, for me, it was really a case of even the small amounts I was charging for a course compared to what some people charge. I just felt super bad that um, in six months time, that information might be out of date. And whilst I, you know, I would guarantee one update. I couldn't continue doing it forever, you know, constant updates because the model changed. Mm. It's changed from when I started doing it. It's a completely different model, now, like completely different. So, and I couldn't keep doing that forever. So I said, well, let's scrap that and I'll move into the monthly. And then what I can do is I can continually make changes. I can make updates to it. And, you know, here we are, X amount of time later, we bring new um, subjects in all of the time. One of the biggest draws will always be the bundling yeah. for, for anybody because it brings a completely new dynamic to people's businesses. And, you know, I still work with the occasional person one to one, but unfortunately, I don't have time. So it's that medium to get access to, you know, three successful sellers in different vein um you know to learn different strategies and yeah i mean i'm so fortunate i'm so grateful to be in a position where uh whilst i haven't got a chart on the wall ticking them off as we go but for, you know what we do is proven yeah it's it's proven success and um you know responsible for dozens of uh successful sellers now we'll say responsible i say that very lightly you know it, it, people 
create it themselves you know we, they just learn from us and they got to put it into action which is the hardest part i'm so glad but, you said you know, that yeah i, I just, just oh gosh, quickly yeah. on, no, on, i don't on claim that. anyone i don't claim credit for anyone's success um or anything like that it's it, everybody that is successful in the hive uh it is down to them but you're it's giving them the motivation own. i mean like that having been in it well i say having been it's not past tense i am in it you yeah you are <laughs> you see it you see it and it's infectious the the, the q4 bundling challenge is amazing me and my yeah. wife we've got six that we're sourcing for at the moment so we're well on track Ooh. yeah we're doing all right <laughs> um nothing's happened yet we're just still sourcing but we've, we've, we've done our research the pan eu the uh european fulfillment network stuff that's super interesting as well um because that's another foot that i'm interested in the wholesale stuff is such a hot it's such a hot ticket isn't it the wholesale model but again it's realistic and i think what people need to realize is nothing stops that hard work ethic it's more advanced for a reason because it is more difficult isn't it and how many people yeah. have you seen come in pay their money and go oh that's too difficult and then they complain that it's oversaturated oh, totally. you know it's it's not it's not you just you need to put in the real effort to get the good stuff do you know what the funny thing is over, over the time i mean that happens in the hive all the time anyway as well but i actually one time had one person when i used to do more one-to-one -one mentoring actually paid me and they i was i was really grateful they said it up front they actually paid me to find out everything to know whether or not they could be bothered to do it <laughs> that that was the goal you know and they were very open and then I had another person you say, can't when I went, them, can you? You can't no, no, absolutely. And they said, look, I figure, you know, everything, which is not true. I don't know everything. Um, but you know, of the area that they wanted to get into, you've probably got a good level of experience of that. And I want to know whether or not I can do it, you know, so we went through it and that person did end up doing it. But then I had another person who I went through coaching with and at the end of it, they literally turned around and went, it's a lot of hard work though, isn't it? Don't know if it's for me. And I was like, okay, fine. But they, you know, at least they knew at that time. And we do, we get lots of people come in, you know, there is no monthly f commitment. Um, I'm not gonna go into saying what I think's right and wrong of what other people do mm. at the end of the day. But you know, like I said, I think it's incredibly good value. We don't have any commitment. We don't tie you into contracts. We don't, you know, make you pay out thousands of pounds, you know, that type of thing. Uh, obviously when you come into the hive, there's certain levels of, um, the longer you, you're in there, the more exposure you get to certain informations, which of course is understandable. Um, but at the, at the same time, we don't, we, what you see is what you kind of get really yeah. um there's no hidden like uh contracts and if you i always say to someone look it costs you a month if if you don't like what you see um then you can leave mm. it's a, no one's going to force you to stay and, you also, and we are you, like the, the worst sales people in the world <laughs> like i end up if someone asked me about it i'll probably end up talking them out of joining more than anything else but you're in a community of well as well of proven successful people and when you see the names, and not just you, Matt and Johnny, but like you said, Mark's in there. Um, did I get his name right? Did I say Mark? Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah just, loads, just loads of people that, you know, and there's a really wide range. You know, we have some people that are at the, you know, the reasonably start of their journey. And we did initially create it that we were going to have a threshold, that we were going to say, look, okay, you need to be doing X amount before. But then I've I've learned, I'm always learning, you know, I, I think the day that you say that you don't need to learn anything is the day you should really stop. And I, I said at first, okay, let's make it for the more advanced market, definitely, uh, which it is, uh, there's, there's no doubt about that. But at the same time, you can't judge someone on how long they've been doing it. I know sellers that have been doing stuff for four years and it's only really recently that they've really hit the big time. Mm. I know people that have started three months ago and are on that kind of seven figure trajectory, you know, after three to six months. So time and experience, I don't think makes a difference, but uh, you know, so 
the hive is constantly evolving. One of the big things we hope to do in the future, which I'm really excited about, is to be able to have separate accountability groups. The, the hive will always remain the hive, you know, the one hive, but to have separate accountability groups for different parts of people they're at at different points in their business because like I said sometimes and I had this recently with the bundle hero challenge that we did recently where if I get you know the same people coming to me um, with the same questions if you get one person coming sometimes I'm my uh, like asking a question and be like okay well that information's in there so go and have a look mm. and you know there's a lot of information in there that's what i would say be prepared to be overwhelmed uh i you know there's a lot of information in there and it, it's in there it's that point you know maybe it's understandable that they've missed it mm. but if i get several people coming to me and they're asking the same question for me that's a learning you know okay there's something i've probably done here yeah that's feedback that hasn't isn't it? resonated yeah the feedback so you've got to be not arrogant enough even with x amount of experience and yes the information is in there you have to be able to take feedback from people to say okay something's not resonating here so i recently had that with some of the bundle stuff so i recreated um and again this is where this looking through something with 15 eyes you know 15 years experience eyes it came down to that is I think I was it was me I wasn't I wasn't looking at it from someone that was starting out in this uh, essentially sorry I forgot to turn that off <laughs> something's just started out um, in this particular field so I kind of took it back to basics we had a full workshop which at the time I didn't realize I was ill either. So we did that last week and it was, oh my God, sniffing my way through it, coughing my way through it, spluttering. And it was really helpful because it took it back to basics for people. And I'm gonna do it again in a couple of weeks time. And I always say, if you do nothing else, just come in and you watch that, then what will happen is if you do that, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, then what will happen is you will build a business that you're able to compound that will send you on that kind of seven figure trajectory. Mm. And I use the phrase seven figure really loosely because I'm actually going to stop using the term seven figure because it's all smoke and mirrors, to yeah. be perfectly honest. I know seven figure sellers that can't pay their bills yeah. and live in, you know, whatever situation. And I know, um, six figure sellers that make more profit than someone doing five million a year you know it's so it's a lot of smoke and mirrors and i i got caught up in it a little bit as well seven figure seller this 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 and whatever i don't think it's very helpful because all i know is everything we concentrate and teach in the hive in particular tends to probably with the exception of johnny who is a traditional fast moving consumer goods lower margin higher volume seller mm. everything else we teach is generally high margin yeah. so it doesn't matter if you're doing a hundred grand or a million if your net margin and we work on net margin we don't work on roi yeah. your net margin if you know what we teach should deliver anywhere between 15 and 25 percent net margin so that's what we tend to work towards in somewhere like the hive as opposed to ROIs which they are important in your business at a certain point in your business but they they tend to be more important at the earlier part of your business as opposed to the later part because it's ROI will help you grow a business definitely but um, margin will keep you in business yeah no I completely agree there are so many numbers when it comes to Amazon and it can it, it smoke and mirrors is exactly right it's so easy to deflect and say that look what I did in sales look look what my ROI is doesn't matter does it you're right it's net profit and net margins that's that's all that matters yeah absolutely and and it is and the longer you're in business obviously the um, you can only go on your last day if you started selling yesterday obviously but we try and encourage a um, a philosophy based on you're not only as good as your last day, the longer you're in business, you start caring less about what you sold yesterday and more about what you sold this month. Yeah. And then the longer that goes on, 
you don't really care about what you sold this month it's what you sold this quarter and then you get to a point where it becomes okay what did i sell this year and what was the overall because certain things have compounding effects um you might go through a period of time when you've been doing this more than probably three years i would say where you might spend two three months of the year in negative profit mm. it's as simple as that because you're shifting stock you're doing this you're doing that um whereas and you're okay with that at that point because you know that profit's going to come later on or everything else that you're doing um but like i said we work towards that compounding effect and there's certain businesses uh income streams we run within our own business at break even because we know that it facilitates certain things so a really good example of that is uh one of the arbitrage models that we have technically runs at break even it doesn't really make any profit at all but what it does do it gives us avios points Bro, and cash back yeah. and everything like that and i've just bought four business class flights to florida return for next year for 1500 quid plus that and if i was paying cash for that it would have been like 12 and a half grand yeah. so you know we utilize the benefits of this business in in like the right area and we teach everyone how to do that uh you know as much as possible uh in the hive and um you know all those little areas but one of the biggest benefits of the hive is the community mm. definitely with what we do and how we do it i could not do it and i couldn't continue to do it without the community because i'm only one person we've only got one business or you know one one part of business yeah, yeah. and what happens is when you are in a high level of conversation i don't mean that disrespectfully but when you are dealing with five eight your five eight eight five errors or five four six one errors and you're dealing with things that in your community that you know about what tends to happen is you tend to discuss it all together mm. and um that's why we, the hive's a bit like fight club you know we don't talk about the stuff that goes on in the hive outside of the hive uh as you shouldn't because uh, it is a paid community it's behind a paywall yeah. um and we work together in that period to uh problem solve and like i said at the time when we named the hive we didn't know that it was gonna form that kind of hive mind and i absolutely couldn't be personally as a successful seller as i am or be as a successful community leader as i am without the community in the hive we fix a lot of problems together yeah. um you know we troubleshoot and like i said if it was just me i wouldn't be ex as exposed to as many issues as as we get exposed to in in that community so you know when you see p people posting in a group outside of the hive and it's really hard for me because you know i i'm a giver i'm i'm a helper and i know the answer but it came from the hive so i can't that's it i can't help it and it's awful and and then you look like the guru because then you say well if you join the hive and it's not me saying that it's but it's about me being protective and being aware of where that answer would have come from and it's not it's not my information to give no i know what you mean no sense. there is and then there's, there needs to be a line in the sand when you are sharing as much information as you share and he, I'm in a similar situation with the, the level of people that I help. And you're right, the community is everything. And the community has made me better. And I should imagine it's the same yeah. for you as well. But the things that we sell, for example, our sourcing masterclass, the mentor program, a lot of people say, are, are these recorded? And you go, well, no, for that exact reason. It's not fair on the people that are paying. It's not fair on them. Yeah. And you need to have some level oh. of exclusivity. Absolutely. I, do you know what? This is so funny. Uh, people often ask me, we had it at Seller Festival because there was people interested in joining the Hive at Seller Festival and they say, how do you protect the information? And uh, because we have a, a number of different ways we deliver, like like I said, workshops, masterclasses, uh, recordings, recorded content, lives, you know, we, we kind of do it all in there really. And how do you protect that information? And I said, well, we do it the best we can. You know, you have to have an email to access it. Um, you know, you have to have a Facebook profile. We, we, you know, we do our due diligence as much as possible. 
But at the end of the day, if someone wants to rip you off and copy it, there's I don't think if someone's that driven to do it, I don't think there's a lot you can do about it, to no. be perfectly honest. No. But I make it bloody hard because I can talk for England. And I tell you what, if you want to come in and copy the information in the hive, then you've got to have a bit of resilience to do it because there is uh, there's hundreds of videos in there, me waffling on. And uh, so, yeah, I always say if someone does manage to do it and we can monitor what people are doing in there, yeah. I don't think uh, that's that's the trade secret I've given away. So we can tell from statistics of what people are doing with the content. And there's a little bit of a telltale sign if someone's trying to copy the information. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we've ever seen anyone do it yet. Amazing. Um, so, yeah. And do you know what? I also think as well. I don't want to be that affected by people. I like to overall think people are good. That's it. And I, it's damaging yeah, otherwise. I like to give people, <laughs> yeah, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Definitely, you know. And I've been ripped off. Don't get me wrong. I've been ripped off. And I'm sure I've had people have, have felt that I've ripped them off. You know, if I've sold them a course and they haven't taken action or it hasn't worked out for them, they probably think, you know, scammer or this or that. And I get that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, it's part of the game, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but like I said, overall, I like to think people are good and they wouldn't do it. And I'm surprised generally when when people do do it. But I'd rather be like that than the other way. Yeah, yeah, cynical and all that. It's horrible. Lovely. I think that is a perfect note to end on that because I've... We have covered everything in the conversation. I've barely, have we? barely looked at this piece of paper. Well, I think so. I think so. Just we? double check. <laughs> yeah. So we got the beginnings. We got the scalings. We got the training and the hive. We did your personal growth. We're good. We're good. Um, I tell you what. Okay. So last question before we head off is the chance promote anything you want to promote. What is it you want to get out there and share to the world? And we we'll put it all in the notes as well. Okay, so I think the best place to find us is, um, and this is going to be difficult because you're going to get this as a little bit of an exclusive by the time, it may or may not have happened by the time this goes out live or wherever, I don't even know where it's going to be honest. No, uh, Someone said to me the other day, oh I found you on Spotify. I said, really? Where? <laughs> How? I said, why am I on there? And I didn't realise that our, never mind the buy box, which is our weekly live that we do, um, Matt uh, right, put it on on Shopify, uh, not Shopify, Spotify. I always get those two mixed yeah. up, and I didn't even know it was on there. And I was like, "Oh wow, this is fun." Um, but th that's where most people were probably best to find us. So uh, we do a weekly live, which is now a podcast as well, apparently. And uh, it's on Apple, it's on Spotify. It's called Never Mind the Buy Box, but we are rebranding it. Oh. So you, uh, yes. So I'm going to say it because uh, hopefully this will live in infamy. And by the way, there is a cat fighting outside the room. I don't know if you can hear this. No, my, uh, it's not my a daughter's wailing. crying. My baby is wailing in the lounge. So. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, maybe it's you it then. It might be me. Maybe, maybe it's you it's not, and it's not a cat. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I didn't know how good the noise deflection is this on this. This microphone thinking... just sucks the world into it. I don't know how it happens, but yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, so, uh, sorry. Oh, right. Okay, I'll, let, uh, I'll, I'll hurry up. Um, so, uh, never mind the buy box. On Spotify, it's on Apple, it's on YouTube. So, it's not only a weekly. We've got, like, the YouTube channel as well. Uh, and uh, our Facebook group is called something different, but we're all, it's all going to rebrand under the new name, which will be out in a couple of weeks, which is, is a, a, ever such a small name, uh, for, uh, change, and it's gonna be called Beyond the Buy Box. Beyond okay, so Buy Box. Beyond the Buy Box will be the new podcast, it will be the YouTube channel, and it will be the Facebook group. And that is where um, we are gonna be doing another platform for our free stuff as well. That is, you know, please come and join us. Come and listen to what we talk about. We do we do videos. We did a video recently on our suspension, which we didn't even touch on, uh, which was fun. So, you know, even X amount of years, we got suspended this year. 
Um, we've got unsuspended now, oh, which is good, obviously. Uh, but we talk about that and, you know, the pitfalls and hopefully tips and tricks. So we release, a bit like you, Des, we release new videos. Mm. We do the podcast, Facebook group. I've been on it. Um, I've been on it. Oh, yeah, of course you have. Yeah, I totally forgot. Des has been on it. Uh, uh, never mind Buy Box, which will be beyond the Buy yeah. Box. So if you are listening before it changes, it'll be Never Mind the Buy Box. And if you are listening, maybe in a couple of weeks, closer to whenever the dates. Whenever yeah, I can't, I can't remember. But whatever happens, whatever it's called, we'll have the links in the show notes. So make sure we're, yeah, oh, we're having in there. Perfect. Actually, yeah, that probably instead of me rambling on for like <laughs> five minutes <laughs> it would have been that but yeah so you know even if even if and nobody joins the hive or or anything like that um then please come and and join the community um we've got a great community and you know we give out 80 percent of what we do is free mm. you know the information we give out is free uh and you know hopefully makes a difference to someone somewhere lovely Perfect note to end on. I think I do better after doing it. Be sure to join us next time for another dose of inspiration. Natalie, thank you so much for coming on. It was it was really lovely to catch up with you. That and flew by, by as well. And I think there's an finish. awful lot. It of always does. And always yeah. remember that. It always goes so quick, especially when you enjoy call. the people that you're talking with, which uh, you know I immensely enjoyed this. I think. No, likewise, likewise. Thanks for coming on.